All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, Zoom webinar as we get ready to launch to learn for the 2020-21 school year in Leander ISD. Um, I'm Corey Ryan. I'm the Chief Communications Officer here in Leander ISD. Um, today, we're going to provide you with some more details and information. I um, want to do some housekeeping before we get started to explain how this is going to work. Um, we have a panel that includes members of our leadership team here, um, superintendent, and I'll introduce everybody as we continue to go through. And then we're going to answer as many questions as we can. Um, we're so thankful that you're taking time out of your day. We know for many of you, this is vacation, summertime off. Um, but this was starting to feel a lot like March and April, I'm sure for so many of us, and especially as the case counts continue um, and news comes out from the state and uh, the region and the nation. And we thought uh, it was very important for us to get out in front of you um, and be able to be visible to answer questions and to give you as much clarity as we possibly can um, at this time as things continue to change um, daily again, um, as we're continuing to respond to the governor, the commissioner, the public health crisis that continues with COVID-19 and everything in between. Um, so we're gonna answer as many questions as we can. We apologize, this isn't going to be the last time you're gonna hear from us in this, in this type of format. I um, mean, this isn't the only way that you're going to be able to get access to answer, to ask questions and to see responses. Um, we've had over 3,000 separate messages and counting um, over the last uh, four or five days um, in, in, with questions from family members and our staff. Um, and we are using, uh, we're creating an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions document um, and website to answer as many as we can. So please keep the questions coming. Please know um, all of the people in this webinar and more are reading them, talking, discussing, considering um, everything that we possibly can and going to respond when we have fine, as much finality as we're gonna be able to have in this uncertain time. I'm gonna go ahead, we're gonna start off with a brief presentation um, and then we're gonna go into questions. We wanted to do a presentation because we wanted to go ahead and be able to take um, and answer some of those questions that we know are on your hearts and minds right off the top um, before we get into Q&A and answer other, other items that we um, need to address or can address. Um, that's for the parent webinar. Um, the parent webinar um, will be offered in, in closed captioning for hearing impaired audiences and in Spanish. So if you know a parent, um, who may have been looking for um, extra precautions or extra extra support, um, please let them know that those will be available. Um, and if for anybody who uh, knows somebody who was not able to get into the Zoom, um, because there was so much high demand, Zoom is capped at 500 people. Um, we are streaming all of these webinars live onto YouTube. Um, we're not sure if the closed captioning works live or the Spanish translation will work live, but we will be doing that um, after um, after it's all done to make sure that we have this in both English and Spanish and have all the closed captions on. Um, so please, um, please share that if you have anybody who you know um, who may need those additional services or methods. Um, wanna just quickly just go over some of the feedback and questions. We've had um, another survey open right now for staff. We had a survey for families. We had a thought exchange. We had a survey back in April and to, into May on remote learning. Um, and there's been a lot of questions about survey questions and about um, responses and how, how that's all been handled. And I, I do just want to make sure it's clear here at the beginning of the presentation that we're collecting baseline feedback and have been um, just to understand where our community's at and have a general idea. But for many of these things and many of the, the items and actions that both staff and parents and students might need to take are going to require a specific action a uh, request for an accommodation when it comes to staff and application, um, if it comes to a new assignment or a virtual teaching position or the selection of a choice, specifically, you know, when parents are gonna have those two choices. Um, the survey is just to get a general feel, but the actual impact and decisions will be made based on actions and choices by um, our families and staff in terms of um, when we get those, um, when we, those decisions have to be made and those actions need to be taken into before the start of the school year. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to our superintendent, um, Bruce Gearing is going to go and, and lead us into some discussion and give us some, 
um, set the stage for where we're at now. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for come, being here today and, and listening to us. Um, and thank you for the work that you're doing Sweet. that you did in the spring. Thank you for the work that you did in the spring um, and that you're continuing to do to plan for the start of school. Um, the first thing I wanna say is that things are changing really rapidly. So we've, we've said that all through the spring and that was true. We had a period where it appeared to settle down a little bit and slow down a little bit, um, but now things are, are changing again at, a, at an extremely fast pace. Um, and that creates a very difficult environment for us to plan as we go forward. So please know that we will try to keep you up to date as, as quickly and as effectively and as efficiently as possible, um, but things are rapidly changing. I also wanna thank the Board of Trustees at this time for the work that they're doing, um, both um, publicly in board meetings, but also behind the scenes as they spend a lot of volunteer hours um, uh, making sure that the district stays uh, pointed in the right direction. So thank you to them. Um, our purpose today, of course, is to discuss what's happening as we head into middle of July. Um, how are we going to bring staff back? How are we going to bring kids back um, in August? Uh, we are planning to operate on the, the published and board approved calendar um, that's on the website. So the start of school will officially be August 13th. Um, and you'll hear through this presentation what that might potentially look like. In the short term, of course, we're headed for an announcement of some kind on July 17th after the board meeting on July 16th um, with a recommendation of, of what bringing staff back will look like and, and what exactly the plan will be for the fall as we bring kids back. Um, we are constantly watching what's happening at the state level with the different agencies at the county level um, and um, at our local city level. Um, we're listening very closely to our public health authorities and making sure that we are following all the guidelines that have been set out from the national level, from the governor of the, of the great state of Texas, and then from our, our counties and, and local agencies. Um, we want to share with you what we know, and then, of course, we want to share what our next steps are going to be. Our number one priority, as always, is the health and safety of our faculty and of our kids. Um, and that, of course, translates into the, the family of our faculties and the family of our kids because, um, because that is truly the most important thing to us. At the same time, we want to listen and make sure we're paying attention to not only your voice, but the voice of our students and the voice of our families. We want to give people as much choice as possible, but please understand that as we give students and their families choice, that creates um, a situation where we have to serve that choice. Um, and that will mean less choice, I believe, for our staff and our faculty. Um, if we have kids coming back to school full-time uh, and in person, then we've got to have um, our staff ready to serve them. Um, and so we're going to work very closely with you if you have special circumstances, and we'll explain that as we go through this presentation. But please know that our uh, initial take is going to be to ask you, if at all possible, to be present um, in person uh, in our buildings. We are gonna do everything in our power to make sure that we take care of you and that we take care of your family and that we take care of our kids and their families. Um, we're gonna put every precaution in place that we can to make sure that that happens um, to the best of our ability and under the circumstances that are dictated to us by agencies that um, control some of what we do. And at the same time, of course, we've gotta make sure that we're providing the high quality and, and um, exceptional education that our community is used to and expects from us and that, that we are responsible for providing. And so we're gonna do everything in our power to make sure that those things happen. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. We're gonna go ahead and move on. And um, Dr. Devin Padaville is you know one of our newest senior team members comes to us from Fort Bend and he's one of our area superintendents. 
Um, and he's been really taking a, a lead while moving during a global pandemic from Houston and, and manage, uh, managing the change that's coming from TEA in the state of Texas. So I'm going to let Devin talk about some of these updates as of July 7th. Thank you, Corey. So afternoon, Leander ISD. Um, I want to start off with this phrase, and these are all updates we've gotten from TEA. We have a, a call with TEA and other superintendents um, almost every other day. And most recently, yesterday, uh, the commissioner re uh, referred to the logistical impossibility of doing hybrid. But he said it's still an, it could still be an option for school districts. But if you research school districts across the state, you will see that every district is slowly aligning to the idea that it is 100% in person and 100% virtual. Now, Leander, you heard us talk about hybrid being a option for our schools. And the reason behind that is it would allow in a greater degree of social distancing if we had students coming in different sets, um, at 50% of students attending at one time, as an example. The difficulty came in the idea that TA is requiring us to have give parents the option that their child comes to school every day. And we are also required to give parents the option to have their child at home 100% virtual. So if we throw in the third option of hybrid there, what we create is an insurmountable workload on our teachers and staff to provide delivery of three different modes of instruction at the same time. We felt um, just like other districts have that this was just not possible. And at the same time, as Dr. Deering described, we have the ultimate responsibility of protecting your health and safety at school. Personal protective equipment um, is gonna be distributed amongst our schools. TEA is providing distribution of um, sanitizer, of uh, gloves, of uh, face shields, and face masks. And then also over the in the next 24 hours when we release our FAQ, we're gonna go into great detail about um, what our requirements by level elementary, middle school, and high school will be for the use of facial coverings uh, for students and staff. STAR will continue, that was new used from TEA, that was almost one of the first things, uh, pieces of information they provided us before there was any public health guidance. Uh, TEA made the decision that we will continue with state assessment, knowing the difficult learning circumstances that are gonna be amongst us um, during the school year. I know many of you are probably wondering how that aligns to the best interest of students and staff. And um, while it would be improper to push you towards a line of thinking. We do encourage you to reach out to your local and state legislatures if you have any thoughts on this. Uh, virtual learning student commitment. So in the next uh, few weeks, we are going to provide an opportunity for parents to designate um, if they wish to bring their student to school and or if they wish to do 100% remote learning. Now, one thing TEA has made clear to us is that parents should have the option of changing their mind up until the two weeks prior to the first day of school. So we do want that information for planning purposes. So we know um, what, how many of our students will be learning virtually and how many will be in the building, but that won't be a solidified number until we get to about the first week in August. Thank you, Corey. All right, thank you, Devin. And we know as this being our employee webinar um, that um, these HR questions, these employment questions, we're seeing them come in the Q&A are of the utmost concern and importance. Um, so we have Kelly Vito, our direct, one of our directors of human resource services um, here to talk about um, what, the, what the employer um, legal stances and what we are what we are being able to do or consider at this point in time um, as we and remember we are still continuing to to evaluate what we can do um, what we can't do and determine what's what's possible to continue to to live up to that supporting 
um, our staff. Um, Kelly, do you want to go ahead and explain this slide? <clears throat> Thanks, Corey. And I, I just wanted to say up front that, uh, as everyone has said, we are here to support our, our staff. We know that there's a lot of anxiety and concern out there, and we are doing everything possible to have a, as many safety protocols in place that help protect staff from exposure during, at the workplace. So there were new federal laws passed that did allow up to 10 days of paid leave for these reasons. Um, and I, I do want to point out that still by far all most individuals who do test positive for COVID are not requiring extensive treatment or, or care. By far the majority have been recovering within three to five days with no additional need um, for doctor care or hospitalization. However, there could be the rare case um, where that would happen. Uh, in that case, there may be additional time, FMLA time that an employee might, might need. So right now, the law, well, there's lots of questions about this. The law does have a max of 10 days paid leave. So we are working closely HR with our teaching and learning team and, and with the, the cabinet to discuss that that is a, a federal limitation that we're, we're, we have right now and what that means for our staff. Um, we also have a lot of questions about accommodations and certainly HR will work with each individual employee who has an accommodation request um, to understand the nature of the medical condition and what exactly might be needed. There may be certain situations where a teacher might need some additional um, protective equipment um, in the classroom. So we're certainly going to work on all those. As Dr. Gearing said at the beginning, um, right now, and um, we are certainly working with the expectation that we need staff on campus, on Leander site. Um, and we're gonna work the best we can to, to see if we can do that and support what's the best for our students. Um, but we are still looking at um, any possibility of, of what it looks like for teachers who are focused primarily on student virtual learning. And, and what that job will look like. So we will be having some answers to all those questions in the Q&A in the next few days. All right, thank you, Kelly. Um, did wanna go ahead and share um, this slide um, because I think it's just important to note as we get a lot of some questions about face coverings that right now we are under a, a statewide um, order by the governor to require face coverings and the commissioner's comments um, for schools is that uh, the, what the governor says is also is absolutely enforceable and, and needed in schools. Um, so I um, just thought it was important to, to share that we know that face coverings are going to be some part of this. Um, I'm going to pass that off to our director of health services. Um, Kristen Wicketts, our lead nurse, um, to talk about some of the public health guidance we've gotten from the state and to talk about um, our approaches as a district when it comes to the public health component of this. Kristen? Hello, everybody. Happy to be here and try and clear up some, um, any questions you may have as we can. I'm just gonna go over the public health guidance we received from TA and please note that this guidance is less than 24 hours old and we are seeking clarifications on some things, but we did wanna bullet point some of the stuff that we found pertinent in the guidance, such as the three week transition option. Um, students may return to school if they have tested positive for COVID um, from a quarantine after they have been fever free for 72 hours and improvement of symptoms along with 10 days after the onset of symptoms. There's a, a COVID team, a campus COVID team and a district COVID team that'll be working together to monitor all these cases. Um, TEA defined close contact uh, as being within six feet for a duration of at least 15 minutes while not wearing a mask or a face shield. We will follow the governor's orders um, that includes face coverings, um, teacher, staff, visitors must self screen for COVID symptoms before coming to campus each day. And we are requiring parents to keep symptomatic kids at home. Notification requirements for um, positive and confirmed cases. We are working on a positive, positive case protocol. As soon as that is complete, that will be shared with everyone. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and then we're going to go to our chief academic officer, Dr. Matt Bentz, uh, to talk about virtual empowered learning. We know in the spring we were forced into emergency remote learning, um, and y'all were heroes in helping get that ready um, in the worst of circumstances. Um, with three or four months of planning and learning from last spring, um, Dr. Bentz is going to talk about how um, the 100% virtual option um, will look different um, than last spring. Dr. Bentz? Thank you, Corey, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just to echo what you just said, Corey, yeah, what our teachers, what, you know, y'all who are on the webinar today and all of our teachers in our system pulled off in the spring was um, nothing short of amazing. And with the can-do attitude and the enthusiasm, um, I just can't thank you all enough. Um, we also, you know, know and recognize that that happened with one, you know, one and a half days of planning. And as we move forward, and if you could click the slide back, that'd be helpful. Appreciate it, we get there so people can follow along. Um, so as we move into the virtual empowered learning, as we move into offering a 100% virtual option, uh, that will be available for any, any, all of our families, any students um, that, that need or, or desire to take advantage of that, um, that it, will, it needed a new design. Um, now that we had the time to um, really research best practices and develop the needed professional learnings and trainings for our teachers. So we um, also gathered a lot of information, a lot of you um, responded to to surveys, uh, the initial survey where we got a lot of responses was um, towards like the, the after we were, you were closing in on the end of the emergency remote learning time in the spring, uh, we got, we did surveys of students, parents and teachers. And, um, you know, this, this uh, will we'll highlight some of the key components that are, that improve uh, the experience for, for um, everybody involved this time around that came out of our, our surveys. One of the biggest pieces that came around from our surveys was that um, parents, students, and teachers wanted more face-to-face -face interactions. Um, they also wanted us to clean up the delivery models and, and the, the, the piece about uh, grading um, came up a, a lot, as you can imagine. So, so first of all, just, you know, there will be there is a focus and there is a plan and there will be expectations for, for parent communications. Um, it'll start with a virtual orientation that, that teachers will, will, will give to their students and, and families so that they'll, families know, what, what, you know what's expected of them and what, to, what can be expected um, as they enter the virtual experience. Then they'll, they'll also be getting, um, parents will be getting weekly emails just giving the objectives for that week. And then we'll be looking at monthly um, Q&A webinars that parents can get on and just talk to their teachers, just keeping that communication flow going. Um, secondly, people really um, wanted a consistent daily schedule so that parents who are working from home uh, know what to expect and teachers have that routine and, and students you know, we all know that um, good practice with students is to establish those routines right away um, and that the daily schedule will look similar um, in some ways to, to at least the, the, the amount of time allotted as a regular school day. Uh, to, to address those um, need to make connections and our commitment in Leander here to build relationships and things, we really are looking at you know, we really need to do the face-to-face -face learning, that synchronous learning. Now we, we will balance that with independent um, asynchronous learning. So it'll be synchronous face-to-face. -face. Sorry, I don't know if I said that right the first time, but there will be times for, for teachers and students to interact virtually face-to-face. -face, um, so that students have that time with teachers, they have that time with their classmates. Um, there'll also be that asynchronous time where students will be working independently on on projects, on assignments, on practice. 
Um, there is, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a grading system and TEA has directed that it will be aligned to the in-person instruction. So, so at the secondary level, that means that um, numerical grades will be calculated and given to students and that those will be included in the GPA. Um, teachers, teachers will need uh, additional training uh, on, on virtual teaching to be successful. So two pieces there, we are going to, uh, we are offering and providing an, uh, a foundational level of training for, for all teachers, kind of a virtual, virtual teaching 101 piece that um, are, are being offered real soon here and then will occur uh, during, during contract time in those days before school starts as well. And then for those teachers that are identified to teach vir virtually, um, in the 100% virtual environment, uh, we have what's called a virtual teaching academy, and those will be um, additional sessions. There will be some choice there to really um, target, you know, do some targeted learning around what you your your specific content area or or um, you know what you are teaching, and, and some pieces there. But so that our our virtual teachers will um, have a level of training enabling them uh, to to be successful and to deliver that high quality um, instructional experience that our Leander families uh, expect from us and have been, and are accustomed to because they've experienced it when, when you all have been teaching uh, in our school buildings. And finally, just um, the use of learning management platforms, um, like you know, the use of uh, Seesaw for Pre-K-2, the use of uh, Google Classrooms, uh, grades three through 12, to really clean up the, deli the delivery systems and um, so that parents aren't getting barraged with, with a bunch of different emails and a bunch of different um, instructions for how to get their students online. Um, particularly at the elementary level, our, our goal is that our students will be able to log in um, through Launchpad and you know, get, get pretty um, adept very quickly at getting you know, moving around and navigating their Seesaw platform so that they will be, um, you know, able to start their work independently. And when parents will come in is when, when they are needing um, um, help and support with the content and things of that nature. Uh, finally, just like to add, you know, that if we do have a, a, a situation where there is a substantial spread, there is always that potential that the entire system would need to move to 100% virtual learning. And so that is why it's so important that each and every one of you, um, that we are providing that, that support through training um, and guidance and, and, and things like that to, to prepare for that possibility that we hope um, will not happen. Thanks, Corey. I think that just about does it. Thank you, Matt. And we're gonna go, and here again from uh, Dr. Patable Devin, who has been leading um, principal and um, administrator and lots of different people who have been working to come up with guidelines for what in-person looks like um, from a safety and operational standpoint. Devin, you wanna share some details? Yes, absolutely, Corey. So um, ladies and gentlemen, just to give you a high level overview, our principals are, are collaborating with us over the next two weeks and we are really working to define safety and hygiene protocols for the building and for the classroom that really protect the health of staff and students. So things we can look for as an example of this, we're talking about structures for arrivals, dismissals, and transitions. And you can probably just, I don't have to explain it, you can imagine that the part of the reason for that is we want to limit the cross interaction of classes as much as possible and the congregation of students in different areas. That is something we need to put on paper and it is also something the campus leaders and our, our classroom teachers and our staff are gonna have, have to be, it, it is a, a extra um, effort that is gonna take to enforce those expectations. And we, within these health and safety protocols, it's also important to us that we uh, have a mindset of compassion and community as well. We know for our students, um, they don't 
care about a protocol or a program, the thing that makes school feel like a real experience to them is their classroom teacher. And so it's really important to us that we take care of you to the greatest extent we can we can do possibly with every resource we have so that you can take care of our students and feel well well supported. Thank you, Devin. And I'm going to pass it off to Kristen. And we've had a lot of questions about contact tracing and notifying of uh, positive cases. So Kr Kristen, you want to talk about this? This will be a process that, you know, is run um, if it's a student or visitor by the school and if it's a staff member by HR, but the, the processes are very parallel. Um, so we're going to let Kristen give some guidance as to what that will look like. Right. Thank you, Corey. As I mentioned before, there's going to be a, comp a campus COVID team and a district COVID team that are going to work very close together and will be really working close together on the contact tracing across the district. So if an employer student tests positive or comes into close contact, um, uh, comes into contact at home with COVID-19 um, positive person, the school or human resources will um, conduct contact tracing and notify that individual um, if they need to do a 14 day self quarantine if they were to have come into close contact with the infected person. Again, um, CEA has um, defined close contact as being within six feet of the individual for 15 minutes or more at any time without wearing a mask within the 48 hours of the individual's onset of symptoms and when the um, individual has left school property. So a couple of the people for these next slides, which uh, weren't able to be in this webinar, but will be in, in future webinars um, or might not be able to, because we have graduation and, and lots of other things going on. Um, we are looking, because I know we have probably some, some art and athletics teachers um, here, we are looking to um, offer students who choose virtual empowered learning, that 100% remote option, have the ability to participate in fine arts groups and athletic teams. Um, they'll have to provide their own transportation, and even if they're in virtual learning, they will have to attend those classes in person. Um, clubs are able to still operate, um, but we're asking for meeting as, uh, virtually to be as often as possible. Um, our after-school enrichment program at elementary is going to be canceled for um, the beginning of the school year through at least December. Um, as we continue to minimize the amount of people who are in our buildings and being able to make sure we can do regular um, cleaning um, after, after in-person school days, um, but we are planning to offer um, that YMCA after school care at this point. Um, for, we, for, um, for parents and families, we know the social and emotional support is of the most um, concern. Um, we know that the academic needs are going to be there, the achievement gaps are going to be there, um, but we know that, or the performance gaps, but we know that um, if, if students can't feel safe, they're, they're not going to be able to, to learn um, and, and safety. If safety is our top priority, then their social emotional well-being has to be um, included in that top priority. So Steve Clark, we to our parents, will provide some more details. He wasn't able to be in this, um, in this webinar. And then we'll have um, Kimberly Waltman, who will provide some updates to parents um, about special programs. And you can see some of those details on these slides. I apologize for moving fast. We're trying to keep this geared as much to staff as possible. Um, that way we can get to um, answering as, as many questions or more questions as we can. Um, Susan Cole, um, one of our executive directors of Instructional Professional Learning, um, is going to just talk briefly about some of the learning opportunities or, or thoughts as the, as the start of the school year. Um, as you can see, this general slide of, uh, that go over, over, shows our progress in decision making up to this point. Thank you, Corey. Uh, yes, this slide kind of shows the pathway that we started as we've been planning for the beginning of school. And so a couple of things uh, that we're going to be just doing it as we move forward is continuing to listen and monitor and connect with um, the information we get from TEA and our commissioner. Um, we're going to continue as an executive leadership team, uh, meeting, discussing the best options, um, continue meeting with our campus principals. We know that the campus and district teams need to connect and plan together moving forward. And then also with our teaching and learning team. And one of the big charges for our teaching and learning team will be to develop this virtual um, teacher academy that was mentioned several times uh, today. 
And so just know that that's going to be, as always, we pride ourselves in Lander about the high quality um, learning that we provide for our adults. And so there's already a lot of wonderful things planned in July. And so we will be finding the best time and opportunity to do that at the end of July. And then how does that also uh, transfer when people are back on contract in August as well? And um, so lots of details still to work out. It'll be a partnership with our um, curriculum teams, our Pathways in Innovation, our special programs team to make that um, just in time and most appropriate to support our teachers uh, to teach virtual learning. Corey? All right, well, I hope we were able to get a lot of questions um, answered in, the, in that top portion. Um, and just to know that we're gonna answer as many questions as we can over the next 25 minutes. Um, before we get on to our next webinar with families and, and some of us might have to duck out for, for graduation and other duties um, as we get ready. I'm, I'm, I'm parsing through the Q&A to figure out what are the questions that um, have the most or highest interest of the people in our Zoom right now. Um, and I'm going to try to combine so we can answer as many questions as possible and, and capture the intent. Again, we're going to have an FAQ published in answer as many questions as we can over the coming days. So please continue to ask and be continue to listen and be receptive. Dr. Bentz, um, there are lots of questions about from our teachers, from their classrooms, um, about virtual learning. I'm gonna combine kind of two questions and, and pass it off to you. Um, how are we deciding who will teach virtually and who will teach in person? And um, there's just a general question of, um, Will teachers be expected to do both? Um, what will planning and time look like for that um, in, in knowing the, the unknown? I know that we have, Dr. Benz, uh, we have a lot of um, things that haven't been answered, but what would you, or, or we're still deciding and determining some of these things, but what would you tell our teachers out there who are wanting to know what to expect next year, um, especially when we consider the two options students will have? Wow, you really pulled together a lot there, Corey. And I, it feels weird not to be on camera. People probably think I'm in my pajamas, but I'm not fully dressed, just FYI. Um, as far as virtual learning, um, as far as staffing virtual learning, where uh, teaching and learning is working with HR uh, in a partnership to develop a, a virtual teacher job description. And we do, you know, we will absolutely be um, working with your principals who will be seeking out those people who uh, desire uh, or, you know, have, have built up a skill set around virtual learning. Maybe during the spring, they found, you know, there was tech savvy people that really emerged and, and felt like they really, in, you know, enjoyed that, that method of delivery. Also, I know, you know, we will be working with HR to look at those um, people who are who have put in information with HR about accommodations and um, trying to make sure that we are are, are, are compassionate in in some of the decisions there um, as far as uh, the teaching models uh, first thing everyone should know this is the most important message I think I can give out to you is that we are adamantly committed to not uh, not having any teachers uh, simulcast in their physical classrooms. And what I mean by that is uh, we do not want to see teachers who have, um, you know, a classroom full of kids physically attending their class and then also have a group of kids uh, live streaming into that physical class and uh, a teacher trying to manage that uh, type of an environment and workload. We don't believe that's appropriate and it, and it won't uh, enable our teachers to, um, to, to deliver the, the high quality uh, level of, of instruction and support for students that our, our parents are accustomed to. Um, second, as we look at, at, at how we're gonna staff virtual learning, we are, we're, we are working with our, our principals. We can definitely, um, you know, I, we're definitely looking at different scenarios where where some some of our positions may you know maybe might foster like a full time virtual teaching position at the some of the younger grades at the elementary levels it may make sense with those self contained classrooms whereas at some of the secondary levels it may look like um, 
some of the sharing the load. Our principals are going to be working collaboratively with each other and with us to staff those positions. Um, you know, there may be some basic core areas where teachers are, you know, designated as the virtual teachers, but some of those, you know, other classes and electives and more, more um, unique singletons, doubletons, things like that, where a teacher might be teaching in person, um, except for maybe one section a day. Um, during that time, they'd be teaching virtually. We're still working out the details, Corey. Thank you, Dr. Benz, Matt, for, for answering that. We have a lot of questions coming in um, about um, leave and accommodations. So I'm going to pass this one to Kelly um, Vito from HR. Um, Kelly, um, we have a lot of um, questions coming in about, um, particularly about multiple, possibly needing to go under multiple quarantines. Um, and, and requiring more than those 10 days for COVID related quarantines. Um, what would that look like? And then we also have um, general concerns about equity um, where we'll have some teachers um, teaching virtually and some people working um, in buildings and some teaching virtually. Um, I know equity and, and making sure that we're going across things fairly and, and to add on to the question to make it a three-parter, I guess, anything you can share about what a process looks like for um, from filing an accommodation or for requesting an accommodation, what does that look like? Um, I know that equity is a big part of what we want to do for HR, especially from an HR lens, um, so that all of our employees have equal access um, to the same services um, and we take care of people. Kelly? So very, very long jumbled question. I apologize for that. But what would you say to, to people who have questions regarding equity and their safety? Uh, what a process looks like for requesting um, requesting an accommodation um, and then just general concern about um, health benefits in quarantining. Okay, great. That was a lot at once. But let me <laughs> Let me start with the first one. I've been kind of scanning through the questions about the leave. So just to clarify, the federal FFCRA leave is 10 days in addition to any accrued leave the district provides you each year. So there, that, that's the answer to that first one. The federal law does only allow um, a few 10 days for any COVID related. Uh, so we are, Still in discussions, I think, as a district of what happens in multiple cases. Um, the, first, the first protection we have, uh, what Kristen said, is that exposure, that exposure definition is within six feet without a mask for 15 minutes or more. So as long as we follow the protocols, we greatly minimize the risk of exposure at the workplace. So, that, so that's the primary thing. Um, but right now, legally, the federal law, it is a 10, 10 day paid max before employees would need to start using their own leave. However, that's something that I believe the district is still discussing. And so we'll, we'll get back with you on that. As far as accommodation request, um, as Dr. Bentz just said, um, HR is really working with teaching and learning to really define what the role is going to be for teachers who are providing virtual learning. So we really need to completely um, understand that, what that looks like so that we're better able to respond to accommodation requests for um, employees who want that type of role. So we are fast and furiously working with teaching and learning to define that role. The process to request an accommodation is to contact HR. The easiest way to do that is by email, which is leaverequest at leanderisd.org. However, I will say that I would hold on your request for accommodation until we have some information on what that position looks like of teaching, providing virtual student learning. So once we can see that and see what it looks like, I think that will give employees teachers a better idea of that, and then if there is a need for an accommodation. Did I get everything, Corey? I think you did, and I, I should have broken it up and just kept on you three times in a row. Um, Kelly, is it fair to say then, um, 
when it comes to the, the, the teachers who will be working in a, a teaching virtually, who will be teaching students who are virtual, um, there could be a path through an application and there could be a path to that position through an accommodation request. Is, is that an accurate description? Right now, as, as we understand it, we are looking at the potential of um, an application process for those positions. And there probably is not going to be an automatic accommodation to that position for this reason. We need to make sure that any teacher would have the appropriate certifications and qualifications to teach virtual. So that it, a request for an accommodation to that is not an automatic thing. We would still need to look at the position um, and make sure that the employee has the appropriate certifications and qualifications. So I would say it's kind of a side-by-side -side path. Corey, if I could just add that, um, Enrollment, the number of students that enroll um, will dictate staffing needs as well. Um, just, a, just a caveat. Kristen, there's a couple questions in here about maintaining health um, and maintaining safety and screening. Um, can you talk about um, the, the self-screening process and um, there's questions about um, testing, um, whether or not we're going to pay for or offer testing for employees or for, for students um, and temperature checks and things like that. Um, Kristen, can you kind of give an update as to where we're at in terms of just general health screenings, what that could look like and, and, and why we're in the path that we're, we're on? Sure. Um, I can give you a possibility of what it's going to look like. Nothing is set in stone. I do know that employees um, will self-screen before coming to campus, coming to work every day. I know we are discussing ways to have students self-screen before they arrive on campus or get on a bus. But like I said, we don't have that set in stone on what that's gonna look like exactly, but those are the conversations we're having. As far as temperature checks, that most likely will not be happening as people enter the campus because they're gonna be doing a self-screen. Um, if at any time a student or staff member is exhibiting symptoms or is concerned of an exposure, they'll come down to the campus clinic and they'll be assessed appropriately and we will go from there. As far as testing, that for employee, on the employee side of things, that's more of an HR um, question. Hopefully they can answer that. Um, and for student testing, that is not something at this point we are gonna be doing at, in the school setting. We do have resources and stuff that we can um, provide to families um, when and if their student or family members need to be tested. Did I hit everything that you asked? I think so. Thank okay. you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Benz, there's a couple of questions about elementary school. Jennifer, this might be an opportunity to hear from, from our assistant superintendent for curriculum as well. Um, one question here for virtual learning, will students at the elementary level still be able to do PE, performing arts, um, library, and the other specials rotations? Yeah, so we do hope that all of our students will be able to participate in all of the courses. We're actually working right now as a teaching and learning team to identify which courses can be taught virtually and which courses are really tricky to be taught virtually. So that's something that we're working on now and hope to have finalized next week for people. And so we know that for some of our courses, there are portions of them that can be taught virtually, but other um, parts of the hands-on options are more impossible. So as you ask about something like library, are we to invite students who are learning virtually to come up and check out library books? Those are the kinds of options that we're still trying to plan for, but we do hope to be able to provide as much as possible for all of our students, whether they're learning face-to-face -face or virtually. Kelly, we have a lot of substitute questions. Um, and as we know, in a, re in a regular year, we have lots of um, the, the acquiring of subs, especially in certain times of the year can be a challenge. Um, the board did approve a, the slight pay raise or pay increase to substitute teachers, but what conversations are happening on HR, in HR about sub substitutes during this time um, in, in this global pandemic? So 
<clears throat> I think we all know that um, it was already a very competitive market for substitutes in the, here locally, and that's just going to be <clears throat> worse during this time. So we are doing a lot of outreach to our current substitute pool um, to try to go ahead and um, welcome them back so that we have them available. We did do a slight increase. Uh, we also did raise to the board that should um, the need happen mid-year, we may need to come back to them with an additional pay increase for substitutes to stay competitive in the market. So um, I know John West, who is over subs in our group, is doing all of this outreach to get our subs up and ready so that they are available to be there and support us as we start this launch. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Devin, there was a question about um, being able to um, come in and out of virtual um, and in person uh, learning and training. We know, or uh, uh, in person instruction versus uh, virtual in instruction. Um, the governor did come out with some or the commissioner came out with some guidance yesterday. Um, what, what is that possibly gonna look like? What would you um, tell people at this point in time based on what we know of uh, what we can expect for parent choice mid-year? Yeah, Corey, that's a great question. And I think anyone who serves in the classroom, you know, the one thing that makes um, routine as much as you can get it difficult is the idea that a student may be here on Monday and then virtual on Tuesday and then back on Wednesday. So I want um, all of our attendees to know we are working to, uh, we're going to discuss in actually our cabinet today of defining those timelines. So let's uh, take a student who is virtual as an example. If a student is virtual and they can come and they wish to come back to school, TEA has told us that we can hold them in virtual up to a certain point. And that point can be no longer than a grading period. So we're gonna define what is in the best interest of our students. Now, the idea that a student is in your classroom and wishes to go virtual, that is still something we are defining as a district. But um, it, for those of us that are concerned about a kid going back and forth, uh, we're really gonna to try to define those timelines to avoid those situations for you. Thank you, Devin. I'm going to go one more time to Dr. Bentz, and then we're going to let Dr. Gearing close this, um, close this webinar. Um, again, this isn't going to be your only time to ask questions, get answers, and we do um, plan to provide this format and in the future as we continue to gear up for 2020-21 uh, school year. And Dr. Bentz, there's been questions about um, classroom size, um, student-teacher ratios. Um, what are what, what can we share at this point about what classroom sizes will look like for the in-person? And then let's go ahead and also add in the virtual learning. What are the thoughts going in to that planning? So I think I can, I, I'll speak to the virtual learning and then I may, it may be preferable that I hand this back over to Mr. Padable who has been um, heading up the, that, that piece of, of the in-person um, logistics around in-person learning and what classroom setup would look like there. But for the virtual learning, um, we are still talking to your principals and working through um, what an appropriate uh, teacher, student to teacher ratio will look like. Um, we do envision um, some degree of flexibility so that we are able to offer to the extent possible um, the courses that students desire to take, the ones that we can offer virtually to, like um, Ms. Collins said earlier, so that a, you know, a ratio, we might not be, you know, hitting exactly on the, at the elementary level on the 22 to one mark, for instance, there may be a, a few less in a class or, or there, conversely, there may be a, a few more students um, in a class as well as we seek to ensure that um, kids are, are getting what they need. Um, as far as the in-person classrooms and what those are going to look like, I um, think I'll defer to, to Devin and the work he's been doing with his groups. Yeah, Corey, can you repeat the question? I missed part of it. 
um, cause I was typing a response. All right. Uh, the, there's questions about classroom sizes. What will teacher ratios look like? Um, Dr. Benz or Matt shared some insight into virtual, um, but didn't want to overstep in terms of what in-person class sizes um, could look like and what social distancing like in person in classrooms um, will look like. So uh, TEA has, like, like we described earlier, TEA has mandated that districts have to offer that families have the option to bring their students to school every day, or they have the option to do 100% virtual learning. So one of the first things we need to do is we are gonna ask for parent commitment. And as we get those numbers in about how many students are gonna be at home learning virtually, then we're gonna work with campus leaders to, to really look at their class enrollments and their schedules and make sure class numbers across the board at a campus are as low as we can get them in order to maximize social distancing and you know, the, the, really the safety and health of our staff and students. So that was a lot of information. We could probably continue to talk for multiple hours. And uh, to be honest, I wish we could as a just staff only, but we're trying to get messages out and to speak to as many different people as possible. Again, this isn't gonna be your only chance to ask questions, to get information and to see us in this format where you can physically see us. Um, we're gonna be returning back to our offices starting next week as well. Um, some of us already are returned to our offices as we continue this, this ramp up for 2020, 2021. Um, Bruce, um, any closing thoughts you'd like to share with our, with our LISD team um, based on the, the state of where we're at right now? Thank you, Corey. Just again, wanna thank you for your patience with us uh, as we navigate these rapidly changing and very challenging times. Um, thank you for your understanding um, of the uncertainty. I thank you for your flexibility and adaptability as we go forward. Our job is to keep everybody safe, if at all possible, and to provide an excellent level of education, if at all possible. And so we're focused on those two things, and we're going to continue to work hard every day to make sure that that happens for everybody involved. So thank you. I hope you have a great afternoon.